Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Aisha Dixon. I am the director of the UCLA Emeriti Retirees Relations Center. And you have such a fun program today. Um, we are so glad to work hand in hand with our um, colleagues at the UCLA Retirees Association, um, Michael Heafy, and just a couple of um, quick housekeeping items. I'm currently going to um, uh, un not allow you to unmute yourself. Um, we wanna make sure our speaker has the floor without any background noises. So you cannot unmute yourself, but you can use that chat feature and type in any questions that you want. Um, and then once we get to the Q&A portion of this program, I will allow you to unmute yourself so you can ask questions. So uh, Michael Heafy, do you wanna introduce our speaker today? All right, welcome you all, glad to have you with us. And uh, as Aisha said, you've been muted and I will do so once we get underway. I wanna to introduce to you from uh, our friends just a little ways up the coast, uh, a chap named Chuck Almdale, who is a long, long time birder and met a member of the Santa Monica Audubon Society. Uh, normally he would be conducting this as a live tour of the Malibu Lagoon, but he, kindly gave us uh, an offer to do this electronically today. So in, in keeping with our safety for our members. So we thank you, Chuck, a 45 year birder. So, or is that the membership in the, uh, in the Audubon Society? Uh, pretty much both. <laughs> well, I have to say I had uh, the pleasure of seeing a Cooper's Hawk and a pair of ducks in my neighborhood just today. So we're looking forward to more from yourself. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chuck Almdale. Okay, am I live? Okay. You're on. Yes. Okay, just, just making sure. Uh, yeah, I'm Chuck Almdale. I've been birding since the late 1970s and same joined the Audubon Society at the same time. Uh, so 45 years, that's pretty close. Um, and I've been a member of the Santa Monica chapter for about 30 years. Uh, when I made the mistake of going to a board meeting and they uh, got me onto the board and then that was the last thing I ever saw. So, um, so anyway, what we're gonna do is talk about Malibu Lagoon. I started birding at Malibu Lagoon in 1979 uh, and uh, had been birding for a few years at that point in time. And it was a very interesting place uh, close by, uh, lots of different kinds of birds. And so I'm going to take you on a little virtual bird walk, I guess, today. Oh, and before I forget, I would like to make the offer to once everybody is out and about and breathing and we feel relatively safe, then I would be happy to lead a tour just for the uh, uh, for the club or whatever it is you call yourself, uh, UCLA Alumni Association, and I can show you these birds in person. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, that's sometime on down the road. We are reopening our chapter two field trips and our first field trip in two years uh, will be in a couple of weeks. So if you go on our blog, smbas.org, uh, there is an announcement and you can sign up if you wanna come. We still have about 10 spaces open for our trip. But this is our first trip in two years and uh, I'm the lead, one leading it, so you know, I'm a little queasy about that. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, uh, most of the photographs in this show were taken by Jim Kenny, who was a longtime uh, member, great photographer. He did all the photographs for a, a book on the uh, flowers, wildflowers of uh, Santa Monica Mountains. So he's got a lot of experience. If you went down to the lagoon right now, this is about what you'd see it would be a beach with a bunch of birds on it and probably surrounded by water on all sides. Most of those birds out there are gonna be gulls, various sorts. Uh, I'll lead you through a few numbers just to sort of locate the lagoon in the world of birds. In the entire world, there are 10,000, almost 11,000 species of birds in 41 orders and two, almost 250 families of birds. In California, we have 23 orders of birds, 77 families, 679 species in California. And then Santa Monica, and these are my records for the lagoon for the last 40 years. I have 19 orders of birds, 
53 families and 242 species. So you can see about one third of the birds that are, are have ever been seen in California. You can see them at the lagoon. Good representation. More than two thirds of the families of birds in, in California are at the lagoon and 83% of the orders of birds. And we can talk about orders and families and genus and species and whatnot later on. But the lagoon is a good spot to be able to see a good variety of what's available in California. Here's a little chart. Uh, shows uh, November, December, and January in the middle. Most birds, uh, we get a lot of birds in December, and January, about 1,700 birds at any point in time. Most of those birds are gulls and terns. Uh, and then when the, gulls and, when the gulls and terns drop off, that's when you see the low numbers. So July, not a lot of species, uh, not a lot of birds, uh, about 500 birds in May or in June. So there's quite a drop off. The biggest part, average number of species that fluctuates from the high 30s and sometimes we will get over 70 species. We had 70 species in February, 72 species actually. So it can get pretty high. That's the winter. Uh, winter is a good time to go birding. If you want to go birding as a group there, don't go in June. <laughs> go in December or through March. This gives you a vague idea of uh, the breakdown of the total number of birds. I've counted up my birds uh, sightings for the lagoon the other day and 292,000 birds I've seen there since I started birding. So out of that number, 45% of them were gulls and terns. You can see how that goes. Other water birds like cormorants and pelicans and things, loons, 20%. Shore birds, only 14% of the total birds. And passerines, uh, I've got things covering up part of my thing here, so I'm not sure where the passerines are on there. Okay, passerines are 29% of the total species out of 242 that I've seen there, 29% of them were some kind of passerine. And we'll go over what passerines are. Only 14% of those species are gulls and terns. So a few species are very, very well represented at the lagoon. Shorebirds, 18%. So we're going to look at uh, 18 common bird families. As I said, we've had 53 at the lagoon, 18 of them I got pictures of, and I thought I'd give you a quick run through of what's available. So we have ducks. These are shovelers. Male are the colorful birds and ducks. The females are not colorful. They're cryptic because they just, they're the ones that sit on the eggs and they don't want to be seen by a fox or a wolf or something. So they're very cryptic. The males are good looking and they act as a nice distraction for any predator that might be around. Grebes look a bit like ducks, but they're not. They're in a different group, different family. And their legs are very far back on their uh, bodies, and they don't walk well on land at all. And most grebes in the world will build nests in reeds on the water. They don't like even like to walk up onto the land to try to get to a nest. They just want to stay out on the water. And it's unusual in the grebes that the young is very colorful. Usually the young are very cryptic, but not so with a pied bill grebe. Pigeons and doves should be familiar to everybody. This is a morning dove, uh, not as in time of day morning, but as in uh, sadness and death. Uh, it has a very plaintive call, very common around neighborhoods. Hummingbirds. Uh, we don't, really only have two species of hummingbirds at the lagoon, but we see them virtually every time. This is a male. The males are the ones that have this bright gorget. Uh, there's only about a 15 degree angle that you can see the colors from side to side on the gorget. The female does not have the gorget. You may have a few feathers that are shiny, but it's the male that's the uh, good looking one. Clovers, uh, we have uh, four, four or five uh, species of clovers. Snowy plover is sort of a, an adoptive bird for a chapter. They've been at the lagoon all the time that we've been birding there for 40 years. This one has been banded, so it has violet, looks like blue and then blue and white and records are kept as to which ones we see and where they're from this one i think was probably uh, banded at vandenberg sandpipers one of the groups i know that you're interested in these are actually technically sandpipers but they're big ones uh the uh 
Marble Godwit here is about 16 inches long, got a big long up curved bill, and the Wimbrel with a D curved bill going down is a few inches smaller. It looks much different in this picture, but it's some sort of optical illusion. Oh, okay, gulls. Uh, not all gulls are white. A lot of people think gulls are white with a black back. These are Hermann's gulls, named after a German uh, birder back in the last century. And uh, they uh, come up, they, uh, they come north from where they breed in the Sea of Cortez. Uh, they start breeding early. They're all gone from the lagoon right now because they're all down in the Sea of Cortez breeding. Uh, and so this is the male uh, or the adults, I should say. There's no difference, sexual difference really in gulls between male and female. You get a lot of turns. Sometimes we'll have a couple thousand turns at the lagoon. These are elegant turns. Brown pelicans. Uh, almost all the pelicans you see uh, on the coast will be brown pelicans. This is a young bird here. And these are breeding birds. So they're at least three years old. It takes them three to five years to get the breeding age. We have six different kinds of herons and egrets. This is a great blue heron. I don't really think it's very blue, but it's a kind of a steely blue. There is another blue that's a heron that's called a blue heron, so we can't have two species with the same name. Kingfishers, belted kingfisher. It's the only kingfisher you're gonna see in California. This is a female. Uh, kingfishers, belted kingfishers are unusual in that the female is a little bit more colorful than the male. In most species where there's a difference, it's the male that's more colorful than the female, but this is a different one. Uh, and there's a possibility that the female is uh, tending towards polyandry. Okay, now we're into the passerines. Passerines are what people call uh, songbirds or perching birds. And their vocal, uh, their syrinx is structured differently than all the other birds. And mo most pass passerines can learn a song. All the other birds, they don't learn songs. They're born with their song and they croak or do whatever they do, but it's not a learned thing. So flycatchers, casting kingbirds, we have them in the winter. Go year round. Mockingbird, if you've ever heard a bird singing two o'clock in the morning and you wondered why it was a mockingbird. Uh, and actually nobody really knows for sure why they do that. I have a theory, but I'm not gonna go into that now. But mockingbirds are all over Los Angeles. House finches, this is the male, colorful face. Once again, they're very common in LA. And this is a song sparrow. Song sparrows are never very far from the water. We have them all around the lagoon. And they have uh, this central breast spot with a bunch of streaks on the breast. Red-winged blackbird, not as common as they used to be at the lagoon, but they like to be near water and they nest in reeds, reed beds. We don't have much in the way of reed beds right now. And the common yellow throat nests at the lagoon, although you'll never find a nest, but they are there year round singing away. And they love to be near water. Once again, you rarely see them very far from water. So a little history of the lagoon. This is from 1870. And you can see there's this, what they call a lake down here. Not really a lake, it's kind of a, a body of brackish water probably just behind what would have been a dune structure all along in here in 1870 with Malibu Creek coming down. We'll move forward a little bit. Uh, once again, there's this body of water here quite long. This is an offshore reef. These rocks stick up uh, and uh, it's pretty much whatever the tide level it is. They can't cover it up completely. This is from the 1940 approximately. This must be a winter picture. A lot of water coming out of the creek, Pacific Coast Highway, no Malibu City at that point in time. And then there's this large body of water over here. That would be like a, a winter pool. 
And we still get that when we get a lot of rain, but um, most of the time there's no water in this area anymore. But if you drive down PCH and you go past Malibu, you'll see that there's uh, still nothing in this area. They're not gonna build any buildings there because they get flooded. Well, and this shows the current too. There's generally a shore current which comes from uh, west to east and it pushes the water coming out of the lagoon off to the east. And so it generally creates this curve. When it first, in the first rains, when the water blows through the beach, it may go straight out, but then this curve will develop. So after a couple of months, you'll see that. So here we are in uh, 70s. This is about what it looked like when I started birding there. There was a baseball field and there was a flat shore, straight shore right on down, a little bit of water going out here. This is the Malibu colony over here. Adamson House here. Map I drew in 79, so I was going to plot where I saw the birds, and I'd make little X's and things on uh, all over this map as to where they were. And there was this island down in the middle of the lagoon at that point in time. That changes. It's gone here. This is um, the reconfiguration that they did in the early 80s, and they created these channels. There were actually three channels. There's one hidden here by reeds, and they put in this uh, walkway with these nice little bridges. The problem was, is that um, the water would uh, back up in there. So they put in the footbridges and they became pinch points. And we would get a lot of stagnant water with dead things and flip flops and whatnot floating in the water. What they wanted to do is create something looking a little bit more like this in Morro Bay where we have channels running into channels and then running on out into the bay. So in 2012, they did a reconfiguration and some people called it a um, restoration. I call it a reconfiguration because people say, well, you can't ex restore it to the way it was and what point in time are you gonna restore it to anyway? So this is what they wanted to have it look like. We call this Bhutto Island and let's see, people parts of the channel where it's, if you can see it on the screen where it's darker here, it's a little bit deeper and then a little bit shallower in these other points. So it'd give birds, uh, like wading birds, some place to wade when, depending on the water height. So the water can go up, up and down six or eight feet. And they started digging, they put in a big berm, blocking off the channels from the main lagoon. Birds were still there. I kept track, very close track of the birds during this period of reconstruction, which took about 14 months. And it actually did not affect the birds at all. We actually had a slight increase in the number of birds and a slight increase in the species. So the reconstruction did no harm. They planted 70,000 native plants. This is Bhutto Island. I flipped the map upside down so you can see that we've got four islands here. Bhutto, some, this is usually inundated at the higher tides. And then another island, a little island here, and then this island. So aerial picture. Here's Bhutto Island. This is above the water now. And this is the water is very low at this point in time. So these islands aren't really islands. And then the water going out here. Now, uh, every year, the uh, Heal the Bay organization does uh, beach bummers. So these are the beaches that you don't want to go to. So Surfrider Beach was on the list in 2012, but in 2013, 14, and 15, and I don't have later records, it was no longer on the list. So they had gotten themselves off the bummer list uh, because they cleaned up the water and they did the reconfiguration. So it really did some good. And as I said, it didn't harm the birds at all. Snowy plovers, we sort of adopted them. Uh, they're a, an endangered they're a threatened species. There's only about 2,500 of them in California. This is the Western snowy plover. They just nest along the coast. They like to feed in what's called the rack, which is the seaweed, which is left at the high point of a high tide, usually uh, near the berm of the beach. And they eat little invertebrates, anything flying in and out or crawling in and out of the rack. They're not, they don't run back and forth with the tide uh, with the waves like some of the other sandpipers do. And there are only seven places in Los Angeles County where you can find them, and Malibu Beach is one of the seven. And uh, in 2016, a pair actually nested on the beach. They hadn't nested there since something like 
1935. So this was a big event. So they laid a couple of eggs. There they are right in the middle. And they put on what's called an exclusion uh, cage, really. It's to keep other birds and dogs and things out of the cage. But the birds, but the uh, mesh is large enough so that the birds can run in and out. There's no obstruction. So they successfully raised, uh, they had two chicks and then one of them disappeared after about a week, probably got eaten by somebody. And here's a little chick here with the father. And these birds are what I would call semi polyandrous. Male and the female mate, they both sit on the eggs. They share all those kinds of duties, building the nest. It's not much of a nest. Um, and then after the eggs hatch, and they both hatch about the same time, within four or five days, the female leaves. And she goes further north somewhere, and then she'll meet another male, and then she'll nest again. So that's the polyandrous section. The male stays with the chicks, but he doesn't do anything. Or he, he will post an alert or you know holler or fly at something if he thinks the chicks are threatened but he doesn't find them any food uh, they do all their own food finding from the moment they leave leave the egg so it's an interesting situation and it's what i call semi polyandrous uh in the female is kind of a sequential and she may stay with her last mate she may do this two or three times then she'll stay with the last mate so a few other birds these are also plovers. These are called black-bellied plovers, and uh, but it, the black belly is there only in the uh, breeding season, and we don't usually see it when they come south in uh, June, July, and August. They may still have their black bellies, but most of the year they look like this: no black belly. Killdeer nest is also plover. They nest on the beach. This one's doing a distraction display. If you get too close to the nest or the young, uh, the adult will pretend it's got a broken wing and it will flop around in a really distressing manner. This looks like a ping pong ball, feathered ping pong ball on stilts. And, uh, and she'll try to distract you from the young. And then you, you know, so the predator will follow her, says, oh, here's a quick meal, I'll eat this uh, killer here. And then you know, when she gets it away from the nest, suddenly, recovers and she's fine. Spotted sandpipers are interesting in that you can see them up in the high mountains. First one I ever saw was at 10,000 feet up in the Sierras. Uh, and the spots are only in breeding season. They go away in the winter, which is when we usually see them. And you rarely see more than one at a time. They walk along the edges of the lagoon looking for something to eat. And they don't hang out with the other sandpipers very much. They're very solitary. This is a willet. Well, it's very noticeable when it flies. It has this very white pattern. But other than that, it's plain gray. Long-billed curlew, uh, we get them in migration. They don't stay at the lagoon very long because they actually like fields or deeper uh, mud flats, and we don't really have that at the lagoon. But we can see them in the fall and in the spring when they pass on through. Ready turn stones are named after what they do for a living. They go around and they flip stones over looking for something hiding underneath it. So this is a breeding one here, the very colorful one. Same time, this is a winter bird. Very plain, doll loses all the red colors. So this is not male or female or adult and juvenile. This bird, give it another month, it'll look just like this bird. And they have a funny, funny little beveling on the underside of their bill. Uh, the top side is quite flat or even a little up curved, as you can see here. That's for flipping stones. And you walk, they walk around, you see them actually do that. Sanderlings are the prototypical or archetypal sandpiper. They're the ones that run in and out with the water as the waves come in and the waves go out and they run back and forth. And a lot of people think that that's what a sandpiper is, but there's actually Mm, maybe 75, I forget exactly, sandpipers in the world. So that's just one species. And uh, they spend the winter, they like to nest or sit on the beach right in, right in where the uh, snowy plovers are. So they're easy to confuse with snowy plovers. Dunlin, a little bit bigger than our other peeps, has this black belly in the breeding season. Most of the time we get it, we don't see that, but it has a relatively long and very black bill for, uh, for the peeps. And 
solid black legs. These sandpipers are probably the most common of the small sandpipers that we get. And it is the least, it's the smallest sandpiper in the world. They're about six to six and a quarter inches long. And they have a fairly pointy bill, a little bit of a curvature in it, and not yellow, but sort of vaguely yellow, yellow green legs. Uh, and so you can tell them from this bird, which is the Western sandpiper. Western sandpiper has a thicker, longer, slightly more curved black bill, black legs. And in late April, they start to get these breeding colors, very colorful. The least sandpiper gets them as well, but most of the year, these sandpipers look like this, very dull. Dowichers are tricky. We have two species, long-billed and short-billed, and people drive themselves crazy trying to figure out which one's which and the size of the bird. Uh, I think the males of the short bill have a longer bill than the females of the long bill. So it's all very confusing for everybody. But when they feed, they feed like sewing machines and that their head goes up and down, up and down very regularly as they walk along. And they'll poke in the water of, uh, looking for invertebrates that are hiding down in the sand. Phalaropes are interesting. We have three different species of them, but the red neck is uh, the most common. And this is a female. This is another species with that's polyandrous. The female is uh, brighter colored than the male. And what happens is they nest in the far north and uh, the male builds a nest, attracts the female. The female comes over, checks it out, likes it. She'll lay the eggs and then that's it. She's gone, she's out of there. And she goes off and finds another male. So she's much more polyandrous in that sense than the snowy plovers. Uh, and the male just stays, uh, sits on the eggs, uh, hatches them out, takes care of the young, takes them out. And these birds, when they feed, they tend to get out in a little bit deeper water and they spin in a circle, creates a little eddy, like a little whirlpool and little things will float up towards the surface and then they'll pick them off with that very slender bill. So we see these in migration. Black oyster catchers. Well, they don't catch oysters, but they will go around and pry open mussels. This is a little mussel. And we get them on the offshore rocks. You don't see them on the beach very often. But if you go to uh, Bayona del Rey and uh, you look at the creek or at the, uh, the jetties there, they nest on the jetties in Bayona del Rey. Uh, and they nest on rocks and they don't, anyways, you don't see them on the beach very often. And there are some hybrids flying around. There's also an American uh, oyster catcher and they interbreed in certain areas and it, it all gets very complicated and it drives some of the birders crazy trying to figure out what it is they're looking at. But the black oyster catcher is restricted to the west coast of the North America. Black neck stilts, one of the bigger birds. They're about mm, 16 inches long, very long legged. Very pointy bill, and they pick things off the surface of the water. And then the avocet. Uh, this are two females. They have a, the females have a more curvy bill than the males. Males are longer and straighter built, and we get them in migration, both fall and uh, springtime. This would be the spring. On to the gulls. How are we doing for time? Oh, okay, about 30 minutes. These are Bonaparte skulls. We used to have them in very large numbers, but uh, for some reason their frequency has been decreasing at the lagoon. We used to get maybe a couple thousand of them. Now, if we find one, we are lucky. But it's the smallest of the gulls that comes to the lagoon and they get this black head in breeding season and then they lose it and the blackness is restricted to this like a little spot here. And next one up would be the ringbill gull. You can guess why it's called a ringbill gull. This is an adult bird. It takes it three years to get to this uh, plumage. Gulls can take anywhere from two to four years to get to their adult plumages. So a four-year gull is going to go through a, about seven different plumage changes, which uh, can drive people, birders, crazy trying to figure them out. California gull is very common here. This is a gull that is honored in Salt Lake City with a big statue. Uh, because they flew over and ate up all the uh, crickets and locusts and whatnot when the Mormons first moved to uh, near Salt Lake. 
Uh, as it turned out, they didn't fly over all the way from the Pacific Ocean, but they nest there. Uh, they've been doing that for probably a couple of million years. So, uh, and they've been eating probably locusts and, and uh, grasshoppers for at least that long. So for them, it wasn't a big deal. Uh, for the Mormons, it was a lifesaver. Oh, and the thing to tell with the California gulls is on their bill, they never lose this black area here. There's a little red spot here. It's called a granidial spot. And there's this little black area here. And that's always there on the California gulls. They have yellowish legs, but a lot of other gulls have that. The back is not as dark as the black in the primaries. And it's a medium sized gull. It's about 22 inches long. This bird here is about 25 inches long. And the back is almost as black as the primary feathers down here. And there's no black spot on the bill. It's a great big fat bill, big yellow, yellow orange bill. So western gull is typically the largest of the gulls that we get on the west coast here. There are some larger ones, but they're not very common. The Waka swing gull is closely related to the western gull. And if you go north, uh, they start to become more common than the western gull around. Portland uh, and even more in Seattle area. And you can see that their back is much paler and it's the same color as the gray that are in the primaries here. These little white things here in the primaries are called windows. Some birds have them, most gulls have them, not all. And this was probably a third year bird, uh, has, still has some black on the bill. And they're a slightly larger than the Westerns and they hybridize. So at the lagoon, we do get hybrids between uh, Glaucus swing gull and the Western gull. They're a little bit darker on the back than the West one. Caspian terns are the largest of the gulls, I mean, largest of the terns. And uh, they're about 23 inches long. And they have this blood red bill or the dark tip and the black on their head is always there, comes and goes on most of the other terns. And they're named for the Caspian Sea, which is probably where somebody, when they first described going around looking for birds and describing the birds, um, found them there at the Caspian Sea. They are worldwide. They're not on a lot of Pacific islands, but other than that, they're on six continents. Royal Tern, a little, it's about the same size as a Caspian, but it's a little bit more slender, has a smaller bill. And they're tricky. Royals and the next species that I'm going to show you are very similar. But here you can see where like the eye, the dark eye is almost a little bit separate from the darkness on the top of the head. Same thing in this bird. This one here, you see a little bit of white right in here. Okay. And the bill, it's not as thick as the Caspian, but it's going to be thicker than the next bird. This is the elegant term. Okay, they get a completely solid dark head. And the bill, even the both upper and lower mandibles are curved and it comes to a very sharp point. So it's a very long, slender bill, very pointy, birds about four inches shorter than the royal turn, but unless they're standing right next to each other, that doesn't help. You can't tell. So once again, a little bit chunkier bill. Forget about the color. The color doesn't help at all. Uh, and then there's this, usually this fringe with this eye will come out and be separate from the black. Whereas with the elegant turn, they do lose some black on the forehead, but this eye always remains in the, surrounded by black. Okay, so if you see one and the eye's right there in the black and it's got this skinny bill, you're looking at an elegant. And that's pretty much a West Coast bird. Least turn is uh, a, an endangered species, and they are the smallest of the terns, or at least around here. Now, we did have some nesting on Malibu uh, Beach right at the same year uh, in 2016 as the snowy plovers nested there. And they hatched about, well, they had about two dozen young. And then there's a high tide that occurs in June. A lot of the times in the high tide swept right over the top of the beach. And so whatever eggs that hadn't hatched and some of the young just got swept away, not to be seen again. And so a bunch of them re-nested and we still had about 20 or 24 young birds that nested on the beach, but they haven't nested there since then. 
So that was a very big deal to local birders and the people who are interested in the uh, threatened and endangered species of uh, snowy plover and uh, elegant uh, least tern. And here's one of them, 20, uh, this was 2017, this one here. Uh, young bird, young least tern, doesn't look much like a tern, but it is. And that was right on Malibu Beach. Black skimmer is the last of the tern-like birds. Sometimes this bird is classified in its own family, but uh, now at the moment this year, it's considered a tern. And they have this really weird bill. There's only three species of skimmers in the world. Uh, and the lower mandible is bigger than the upper mandible. And they, that's because they feed like this. They fly along and they cruise that lower mandible in the water and if it touches something hopefully a little fish it snaps shut in a fraction of a second and i've watched him many times doing this and i'm always waiting for him to hit a little twig or something that's under the water that's not going to move and watch him do a flip end over end but they've never done it so they're good at it And we do get dead birds in the uh, lagoon sometimes. Western greed, that was me. There's a water feature there that has a nice map of uh, these, the watershed of uh, Malibu Creek. And underneath where it dripped, there was this black widow spider. So that was entertaining. Don't put your finger there. I like this picture because it shows two pairs of two different species sitting right next to each other. Uh, these are mallards over here, male and this is a female and this is a male mallard. And then we have, of course, female and male humans. And uh, there's a term in, uh, in zoology, particularly applicable to birds, well, uh, sexual bimorphism means that uh, there's two forms that the species comes in depending on their sex. And so with birds, it's the difference in the plumage and in humans, various body shapes and other things. So we're all sexually dimorphic there. A lot of birds are not. Uh, the terns, the gulls, the herons, uh, but they, the males and the females look the same. And the only way we can tell them apart is by grabbing them and taking a real close look. We get a lot of mullet. Uh, sometimes they're called jumping mullet or striped mullet. They go by about 20 different names. And the lagoon at times is just jam packed with them. And we had no idea really how many there were until there was a big die off a couple of years ago. Uh, it got very hot in August and the lagoon water was uh, very low um, and didn't have a good oxygen content because the ambient temperature uh, of the air was about 95 degrees. And so uh, the air just disappeared out of the water. And we had thousands, many thousands, maybe three or 4,000 mullet died and just floated on the top of the lagoon. And we had no idea that there were that many fish in the lagoon. But this was from a little bit earlier when we were, they'd gotten into the lagoon from the ocean and then uh, they closed up. And so they just reproduced like crazy. Sometimes we trip, end our trip at uh, Adamson House, which is on the east side of the lagoon. They have a nice patio. They've rebuilt this patio since then. So when we start doing our trips again and ending over there, it's a nice place to uh, stand and look at the uh, lagoon and count up our birds. And I don't have a sunset picture because I'm never there at sunset. So this is a morning fog picture. So a lot of different pictures from people. Now, this was the end of the main part, I've talked for about 40 minutes. So I have more pictures that I can show, but uh, Michael suggested that we uh, take some questions, do some questions and answer, and then if there's any more time, uh, other different yeah. kinds of birds. So what do you want to do? That's great, thank you. Um... So let's see, if you have any, there's no questions in particular that came in the chat, except for one, um, are there any of the birds that are territorial that they exclude themselves from other species in their space? Territorialities, uh, in terms of birds of the lagoon, no, uh, they're not very territorial, uh, except for some of the passerines. Uh, territorial usually means you're trying to defend uh, a feeding territory. Uh, so 
most passerines need several acres or whatever of land. Uh, an eagle might need many square miles of land in order to find enough food. Seabirds, it's a different situation. Uh, seabirds are territorial at the nest, and if they're sitting on the nest, their territory extends as far as they can reach. So if it's a big seabird, like a brown pelican, they might be able to reach six feet and give their neighbor a poke. Uh, but because of the way they feed, they feed in groups, and if one pelican finds a flock of a school of fish, then all the other pelicans want to know about it, and they don't really get in each other's way. And they're not territorial in that sense. So territoriality doesn't really apply to shorebirds and seabirds. Uh, it's just right around the nest. They'll be very picky about who's who's there. Okay. Hmm. The next question: What is the best time of day to go bird watching? Uh, at the lagoon, if you want to see any of the passerines, the little birds in the bushes, then just about any time, anywhere you're looking at passerines, it's better in the morning. They've been sleeping all night, they wake up, they're hungry, they want something to eat, they gotta get up and go look for it. Uh, a lot of times they'll do a little bit of a song just to let their neighbors know that, hey, I'm still here, so stay out of my territory. Uh, and they call it dawn song, and then they go look for food. And then they, when it starts to get warmer, if they've eaten enough, they'll just slack off in the middle of the day. So a lot of times if you go birding for uh, pasturings, then um, I have to do something here, just a second. Well, your and camera's off, but I, I just turned off the screen sharing since we were still talking. Okay. So, so we don't see you. Oh, okay, whoops. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, can you see me? Uh, no, we see two car five, but I think I'm going to check. I'm going to change your name. Chucker. That's Chucker. Okay. Okay. Chucker. Yeah. Your, your screen is blank, Chuck. There might be a uh, stop video little uh, icon down on the lower left screen corner that you can click oh, on. So, oh, okay. I got it. I just saw it. All right. There you go. Okay. okay. So yeah, you were talking about the best time to go bird watching. Yeah. So for for passerines, forest birds, the morning is always the best. Uh, that's when they're active. That's when they're looking for something, look, something to eat. For shorebirds uh, and ducks, it doesn't really matter that much because when we see them in the lagoon, most of them are either feeding at the lagoon or they're resting, and so they're just sort of sitting there or they're not moving very quickly. So you can actually go out two in the afternoon and see almost the same number of birds as you're gonna see if you go out at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, there are some birds that may stay there all night with some of the gulls and then they get up and they fly away. Some of the gulls like California gulls fly off to the closest dump, go look for something to eat at the dump uh, or they fly out onto the ocean and if they come across a school of fish then they're all out there. But uh, so but we do our walks at, uh, at the lagoon starting at 8.30 not too early, uh, but it's early enough. And we will do catch a number of passerines in the early part of the bird walk. And then by the time that we're, we're done, the, the birds are pretty much done too, the passerines. Next question. Uh, speaking of on-site tours, when do you think the, uh, the next one might be? And are there um, organizations specific to plovers? So it's kind of like two questions together. Uh, what was the second part? Flown birds? Uh, the first part was when uh, might be the next site guided viewing. Yeah. And are orgs specific to plovers? I'm not catching your phrase, flow birders or something. Plovers, P L O V E R S, plovers. Yeah, the bird species, plover. I don't know any bull birds. Bluebird, there's a bluebird. Uh, well, we're doing, we're starting up our field trips on the 27th of March, uh, 830. And uh, there's an announcement on our blog, smbas.org. Uh, and if anybody's interested, uh, you can come. There will be restrictions. Um, I, I'll probably be wearing a mask because people come up and ask me questions and then they breathe in my face and so, but uh, nobody else is going to be required to uh, 
have a mask, but they will be required to show their, that they've been vaccinated. So that's the requirement, but all the de details on that are in the announcement on the blog. And then if that goes well and we don't have any trouble with people, uh, you know, people follow the rules, then we'll probably have a few more trips going to other places like Sepulveda Basin or uh, Sycamore Canyon. There's a number of birding spots around uh, the Los Angeles area and in Santa Monica that are good for birds. And we will continue with the mallow. Our trip is on the fourth Sunday of every month. So it's not the last Sunday, it's the fourth Sunday, and it's always it starts at 8.30. And we will most likely, barring uh, a jump in the pandemic, uh, we will be continuing that from now on, starting in March. And, so as I, as, and I still don't know what, the, what your second part of the question was. I don't understand. So I, I can tell you, Chuck. So um, two things. Uh, I did put the website in the chat, and it's S M. B A S blog.com. Okay, well, which, that'll work too. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, I couldn't find the other one you were mentioning, but oh, it's okay. Santa Monica Bay Audubon Society.com. Yeah. And I, I think the word was, you know how there's snowy plovers? P -L oh, plover, plover. Plover. Yeah, with yes. a P, P L O V E R, snowy yes. plovers. Snowy plovers, although they don't really nest at the beach, they're there. 10, um, 10 months of the year, they start showing up again in June, late June, and then they're with us and they start leaving in maybe some in March, some in April, and then sometimes there's still a few hanging around till May. So May and June, they're really not there. And then rest of the year, they are there. And we can have anywhere between five of them and 80. And they sit on the beach between the lagoon and the ocean, if you want to go down and look for them yourself. But they're very cryptic. They're hard to find. They sit in these little holes, tiny little holes that your heel makes. That's enough room for them. And uh, they stay there out of the wind. Uh, and when the tide changes and you hit high tide and it starts to drop, that's when they go out and they feed on the uh, rack. And then once oh. the tide starts rising, they go they go back and sit in the beach and they rest all day. Okay. Um, and the other question is about, do you know if the salmon are returning to Malibu Creek? Who administers the creek and the lagoon? Well, I don't know that salmon were ever in Malibu Creek. Uh, some people may think it has, or some people may have evidence that it has, but if they do, I have, I have never heard it. However, there are uh, steelhead trout. And steelhead trout did used to be in the lagoon and uh, in the creek, and they probably swam fairly a fair distance up the creek. But there is a dam that's several miles up the creek called Ringe Dam. And they're not going to get past that dam. So uh, I think people do occasionally see them in the lower creek, um, below the dam, and uh, maybe in the lagoon, in the cr uh, creek just above PCH. But the main fish that we have is the mullet, and we can have thousands of them in there. Plus, there are also uh, a threatened, I believe, uh, tidewater goby, very small little fish, a couple inches, and they hang out just in the lagoon. But we never see them. I think you'd have to put on scuba gear or something to go and go swimming around and look for them. There are a lot of invertebrates, crabs, and little things crawling around on the bottom of the lagoon and the channels. And where Steve do you Clovers, normally? Sorry. Yeah, I just saw saw uh, a message that somebody had put on the chat about Annenberg. That's uh, in Santa Monica. There are uh, snowy plovers on the beach in Santa Monica in front of Annenberg House. That's one of the other seven sites in Los Angeles County. So where do you normally meet for these tours? Uh, for the tours, we meet right at the lagoon. There's a, an entrance to the park, Santa Monica Beach State Park, or Malibu Lagoon State Park. It's west of the uh, bridge over Malibu Creek. There's also parking on the east side of the bridge near Adamson House and Surfrider Beach, but that's mostly surfers. And we don't really go on that beach because it's usually jam-packed with people, and there's not a lot of birds. And it's easier to get to the lagoon from, from the uh, western entrance. So there is a parking lot there. People also park on PCH, both sides. And you can go park on some of the other roads in Malibu Village, uh, where there's uh, there are metered areas and there are non-metered areas. 
So okay. that's so we meet at 830. But there is right next to the parking lot at the edge of the lagoon, there's a metal structure. It's like a pavilion or something like that. And that's where we meet. It's pretty hard to miss if you walk in. Do you sorry, do some bird species stay at Malibu Lagoon year round? Yes. Uh, the lowest we'll get is down around 25 species, 25 to 30 species in June. That's when most of the birds are off breeding. But in terms of breeding birds, we the mallards and gadwalls, two ducks, breed there. Um, Pied bill grebe has bred there in the past, but there aren't very many reeds right now, so it's they like to be in the reeds. Killdeer will nest on the beach, um, and then as far as shorebirds and gulls, that's about it. Uh, all the rest of them go somewhere else to breed, but we do have a number of passerines that breed around the edge of the lagoon, like common yellow throat, song sparrow, California towhee, uh, and also blue gray gnat catchers. Um, marsh wrens used to breed in the lagoon, but they stopped because the, the reeds went away. And then if you get a little further away from the water, there are several hawks that breed in the area, a uh, red-tailed hawk, and rough-shouldered hawk, uh, not red-shouldered hawk, uh, breed up the creek a little bit. Uh, and then they come down and they hunt for things down around the lagoon. So that's about it. But we still have, there will be birds that do stay for the summer. You know, they're not of breeding age yet. It takes skulls anywhere from two to four years to get to breeding age. So meanwhile, they just hang around the lagoon, sort of like surfers. Um, so yesterday, someone saw about six dead birds at the, at the Santa Monica beach, and they were lifeguards rescuing another injured bird. Were these grebes? Were, what kills them? They had black and white feathers. Black and white feathers. Okay, black and white's really common in seabirds. Most seabirds have some variation on that theme, and the theory behind that is, is that if a fish is swimming underneath that might want to eat a bird. What he sees is a pale belly against the pale sky, but a predator flying overhead sees a dark back against dark water. So they hide that way. Uh, so black and white feathers just means it's some kind of seabird. Now it could be Western grebes. They do uh, get in oil slicks or things like that, or maybe they get it some kind of disease. So that bird that I was holding up dead on a stick was a Western grebe and they will wash up on the beach. Other than that, I don't know specifically what's washing up on Santa Monica Beach, but uh, Western Grebe is a good bet. And then there are gulls die for various reasons, so they wash up on the beach as well, sometimes cormorants as well. And if they get into some kind of a oil slick, that, that can kill them. So it might be one of those three species. Okay. Um, are the osprey hunting in the lagoon year round? We see them almost year round. If they're, they don't nest there, at least I've never seen a nest there. Uh, but uh, all, there really isn't any months of the year that you might not see an osprey, although they're definitely more regular in the winter. So they're coming in from somewhere else and then staying in the winter. We see them catch fish all the time. Uh, well, I shouldn't say all the time, but we see it often enough. So they they do quite well in the lagoon, and they really like the mullet because it's a big chunky fish, lots to eat. You can eat one or two mullet a day, and that's all you really need. So uh, sometimes the fish is so heavy they can barely get out of the water. When osprey come and catch the fish, they catch it with their feet, and if it's heavy, they gotta swim. They they maybe above the the ability to stand in the water, so they have to struggle back to the surface then get this thing out of the water and then get back to a perch where they can eat it safely. Okay, That's, how often, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, okay, go to your next one, which is about gadwall. Gadwall nested the lagoon now. I don't know when they started, but they've been nesting there for at least three or four years. Uh, and actually, I think there were more gadwall nesting at the lagoon last summer than there were mallard, which is an unusual situation. I would count up to 100, including all the young ones out there floating around on the water, uh, about 100 gadwall and then maybe half that number of mallards. So they're nesting there, but they do it on the little sand islands, so nobody goes out to those. 
And so they're pretty safe out there. Okay. Does that answer the question? I think that answers the questions, yes. Okay. So um, does anyone else have any questions? Please feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself. You have the option to just uh, unmute or raise your hand so I can call on you. Okay. Um, well, I, I just wanted to put some more information in the chat about um, this wonderful organization, uh, the Retirees Association. So without them, you know, these programs we couldn't bring to you, whether or not it's Zoom or in person. So if you're not a member of the Retirees Association, please do consider joining. Um, we did have another question come to the chat. So um, let's see. If you, you mentioned that the other hummingbird species is Rufus or Allen. Allens. Uh, we have had Rufus, but it's not very common. And Rufus and Allens are so close to each other in the way they look that uh, it's, it's very hard to tell them apart uh, under certain circumstances. Uh, so, but we do have Allens, and I'm pretty sure I know, well, I, I know they're nesting at the lagoon now. The Allens is an interesting story. Anna's hummingbird is long been local and resident in Southern California and they're here all year round and that's been going on for since time immemorial. The Allens was, uh, there was a subspecies that was out on Sata Canalita Island and that's the only place you could find them. And then starting about 20 years ago maybe, they started showing up along the coast, our uh, mainland coast, and they have spread up and down the mainland coast, uh, probably 100 miles in each direction, and they're starting to spread a little bit inland. So you can now see uh, Allens in the winter in San Fernando Valley where I live, uh, and they're all from this particular subspecies that was originally out on the island. And so they're, they're here resident now year round. It's just the further away you get from the actual coast. And I'm, I mean like, you know, more than a mile away from the coast, um, then they start to drop off in numbers in the winter. So, but normally you, you tell them apart that the Allens has got a lot more green on the back than the Rufus. And there are other differences, but there, it's a very tricky thing to distinguish. And around here, most birds with a rusty color on their flanks or on their back are going to be owls. Uh, Rufus comes through when they're migrating, and they can migrate through as early as January. So it's a tricky call. Okay. Um, and the rin Rindage Dam, further up Malibu Creek, scheduled for removal? Yeah, it's been rumors. It's been scheduled for removal for about 25 years or maybe longer. Uh, I started going to meetings having to do with the creek and, the, and Malibu Lagoon back in the 90s. And there was a subcommittee working on getting rid of the Ridge Dam. So that's 25 years now. Uh, I've, I've seen glacial pace in when it comes to governmental action. And this is just way beyond that. Uh, and it's a tricky thing. There's the, one of the things they're afraid of is blowing, taking the dam out because there's so much sediment backed up behind the dam that they think it's per performing the function of keeping the sides of the canyon from caving in. So if they took out the dam and all that sediment came downstream, first off, the people downstream don't, don't want to see a wall of sediment coming at them, knocking their houses down. And number two, they don't want the road to fall down. So. Those are the two tricky things. They built that dam for something like five or $10,000 about a hundred years ago. And they're talking millions and millions to take it out. It's just, it's unbelievable. If it ever goes, I'll, I will be personally be surprised. Wow. Um, how often do Bonaparte's gull pass through? Well, they used to winter there. So you could see them six months of the year. Uh, but now it's a, kind of a May and fall thing. Uh, I'd have to look at look at my figures uh, to be able to say exactly when. Um, and if somebody wants to send me an email, uh, if they go to the blog, SMBAS, you can Google SMBAS and chances are about 99.99, it'll take you to our blog. And there's a contact page on there and it lists all the officers and I'm on there and with my email address. And if anybody has any questions like that, that I just don't know off the top of my head, send them to me and I'll answer them. So Chuck, is your email still at Verizon? 
Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Which one, which email do you have, Miss Gliss? That's what it is, yeah. That's it, yeah, they can send it to that. That's the, that's, that's the address. So I will also follow up via email. Um, I'm gonna ask Chuck for his slides if he feels comfortable sharing them. And then I'll put his email into a follow-up email as well as the website so people can um, sign up for this field trip. That sounds exciting next, next week, right? Um, yeah. 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 That sounds, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 10, 12 days. I've only, there's only 10 spots. It's filling up fast. So I uh, got to get, got to get that email to me. <laughs> and, and don't forget your mask and or vaccination card, you said? Well, vaccination card for sure. Uh, I really don't want people to, who haven't been vaccinated coming. I've already gotten complaints about that from people who said, what are you nuts? Uh, but uh, that's since I'm the one leading the trip and it's my health. Uh, exactly. That's, yeah. that's why I'm doing it. But vaccination card, that's good enough for me. Uh, and if they want to wear a mask, anybody can wear a mask if they want. I'm not going to make fun of anybody for wearing a mask because I'll probably have mine on. Okay. All right. Any other final questions? Like, um, Chuck, this has been amazing. I, huh. I'm i not an avid bird watcher before, but I think I'm going to take a little bit more of a look when I see birds because I didn't realize just how... Um, abundant i guess because of our climate in southern california we get birds from all over this is fascinating um okay final chance to ask the question before we let chuck get back to his afternoon please feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself barbara oh, sure. yep, unmute yourself first hello hi hi I want to thank you for this really good, good program. I, I've learned a lot, and uh, it's super nice of you to prepare it. Uh, well, I love birds. Uh, I fell in love with birds in 1976, and it just never went away. And uh, so what can I say? I love birds. I want everybody to love birds. I want people to <laughs> come and know their birds, their feathered friends, which are you know, make keeping our lives ever so a little bit brighter, you know, in our hours of quiet desperation and whatnot. You can listen to a bird singing in the backyard. Thanks. Any sure. other questions? Again, I'll be, this is being recorded. So once I get this uploaded to our YouTube channel, um, if you haven't had a chance to check out um, our previous vis uh, programs on Zoom, um, you know, the past two years, we've we've all lived in this weird Zoom world. So um, I will uh, post our Zoom channel, sorry, our YouTube channel in the Zoom so you can kind of see what that looks like and feel free to subscribe. So any program that we have where the speaker allows us to record, we do record it and we post it in our YouTube channel. Okay. Um, I do see one final question before we let you go. How concerned, oh, Humans two go. questions. Yeah. Two, two questions. What time is the walk on the 27th? It will be at 8.30 in the morning. Okay. okay. Second question. How concerned are you with the decline of Herman's gold or Herman's? Herman's, yes. Uh, that's a problem. Um, and frankly, there are probably people who know a lot more about that than I do. They do nest uh, something like 99 or 98 percent of the world population of human skulls nest on one island in the middle of the Sea of Cortez, Isla de la Raza, R-A-S-A, -A, not R-A-Z-A. It's a very small island, about a square mile, and uh, the elegant terns also nest there. And should anything happen to that island, uh, then boom, that's the world population of human skulls. What happens is that they have these bait fish or fish failures. And if there's no fish of the proper size for a human skull to eat or for a young human skull to eat, then they have a total nesting failure. And even though there may be 500,000 of them down there, they might only crank out a few dozen young ones. So it's a whole really a bad problem. I don't know what, if anything, can be done about it because it's really dependent upon what the fish are up to. Uh, other than that, there have been years when we didn't get any young Hermans coming up to uh, California from after the nesting season. This year, we did have some, so it's a, it's a problem, but, but their numbers do fluctuate incredibly uh, depending on whether they had nesting success or not.
Well, fortunately, they're not, they're, you know, their gulls will live 15 or 20 years. I'm not sure about humans, but gulls in general. So, you know, they could have a bad year and the next year they could have a great year. So that's it. Anything else? Um, thank you, Chuck. And I want to thank Barbara Wold, who actually brought this program to us. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And Chuck, some amazing photographs. You have a great crew of picture takers yeah. that uh, helped you out. But uh, your knowledge is just unbelievable. So thank you for sharing that all with us. My pleasure, actually. <laughs> um, I also wanted to just throw out a, uh, a bold advertisement for a couple of programs. On uh, April 8th, we have a talk with Arch Getty from the UCLA History Department uh, on Russia, which could be very enlightening considering what's going on right now. Uh, also, that same day, we have the uh, Nefertari's Treasures walkthrough. On the 14th, we have Pamela Monroe, uh, professor in linguistics at UCLA on UCLA slang. And finally, we have just uh, recently set up a virtual tour of the Vonda Museum in Culver City. That's the Wendy Museum uh, on Cold War. So baby boomers, button up and come on down. So I do have two final, I guess, jokes. Um, this has been very exciting, the eggs, birds. Um, and Yay. hopefully, Chuck, this wasn't too much of a burden for you. Oh, oh Steve Baum is not here, so I needed my, my, my bird joke. Did I, did I foul it up? Oh, well. I think I'm funny. Okay, well, goodbye, everyone. Have a well done, afternoon. Aisha. <laughs> goodbye. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Keep safe. Thanks. <laughs>